Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Our dear viewers, my dear brothers and sisters, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you this, on this blessed evening. This is Muhammad Faqih, the host of this uh, conference, the Hajj Legacy Conference uh, tonight. Uh, tonight's episode is a very special one. Um, I'm going to be joined shortly, inshallah ta'ala, with our guest speaker, Sheikh Muhammad al-Shinnawi, hafizahullah. He is a graduate of English literature. <coughs> Brooklyn University in New York City. Uh, he studied uh, at the College of Hadith at the Islamic University of Medina. Uh, he's also uh, a graduate of uh, Mishka University. Uh, he translated major works and he also is affiliated with uh, Yaqeen Institute and he's an imam in, the, uh, in, in Pennsylvania. He's going to be sh uh, sh shortly joining us inshallah. Tonight's discussion is a very interesting discussion. It will be about one of the greatest uh, figures in our history. Uh, the father of the prophets Ibrahim alayhi salam is someone that our own prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was told to follow in terms of, uh, to be inspired by and to follow his example. He was uh, obviously his great grandfather, the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, as you all know, is a descendant of Ibrahim. He was actually the fulfillment of Ibrahim's uh, prayer uh, and dua and a da'wah to Abi Ibrahim, as he said. So this extraordinary figure in our history and the history of humanity, the most, you know, perhaps one of the most celebrated prophets um, in many religions, Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes him as someone who was an ummah. Uh, he was a nation or he was a community. Um, great character. So tonight we're going to be talking about some of the aspects of the Abrahamic ethics and, and his personality and his, uh, his lessons from his akhlaq, from his manners, alayhi salatu wassalam. So without any further delay, inshallah ta'ala, I'd like to invite our dear speaker and guest, Sheikh Muhammad al-Shinnawi, to join us, inshallah. Welcome to the program, to this episode, Sheikh Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum, 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 assalamu I mean, for you the same, Sheikh. Allahumma I mean. Allah. SubhanAllah. We were hoping to meet in Mecca or in Medina around this time, huh? Yeah, you were one of the last people I met last year after Hajj. We bumped into each other in, in the road, all right? Right before Fajr? SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. Yeah, that was beautiful, beautiful memory. SubhanAllah. Allahumma alaikum. Yeah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to gather there together, bidnillah. I mean, all the Muslims, Ya Rabbi. So every year, uh, you know, millions of Muslims would respond to a call made by Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, who is the subject of tonight's discussion, right? SubhanAllah. Yeah, SubhanAllah. The, the, the dua that uh, continues being answered, right? SubhanAllah. Now, uh, Shaykhna, you know, Prophet Ibrahim is, uh, you know, obviously a very interesting and fascinating figure. Uh, in our history, alayhi salatu wassalam. And, you know, it's, it's amazing how uh, he's also the second most mentioned prophet in the Quran. Uh, you know, so, you know, what do you find most fascinating about, about him, alayhi salam? Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wassalam wa rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. That's a very difficult question. The most fascinating thing but uh, considering we, uh, we don't want to get charged with false advertisement, we said to people who speak about Abrahamic character, uh, I'm deeply fascinated by how Allah Azza wa Jal illustrated uh, perfect character in the Quran through Ibrahim alayhi salam, of course, through so many others. But when you consider him arguably the second greatest prophet of all time, uh, though there is some khilaf, right? There's some controversy whether it was Musa or Ibrahim alayhi salam. Uh, but when you consider that Allah Azza wa Jal told the, the most well-mannered, greatest charactered human being ever, which is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to take Ibrahim Alayhi Salam as his example, uh, 
فَاتَّبِعْ مِلَّةَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ حَنِيفَةً right? Follow the example in the way of Ibrahim alayhi uh, salam. And then our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was said to have said, uh, I was not sent for anything but to perfect a good character. That should call our attention to the fact that uh, of the greatest things Allah Azza wa Jal was directing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's attention to so that he can live up to and carry that mission was the character of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Uh, and, and there's so much to, to be said about, you know, character needing to come through the prophets to begin with before you even speak about Ibrahim alayhi salam himself. But, but maybe that should at least be said uh, at the onset. Now, nowadays, we think that like the moral debates have no end. Everybody has their own subjective morality. I think this is moral. I think that is moral. Whereas the Muslim believes that without Allah azza wa jal, without a perfect, neutral, you know, uh, wise um, God subhanahu wa ta'ala the one and only you cannot really have number one objective morality number two uh, actualizing that morality because that's the whole idea that number one you have to identify what the perfect balance is that philosophers have always debated about what's the balance between this virtue and that virtue when there's a conflict between them right how do you prioritize and how you reconcile values competing values good values but what happens when they, they're competing identifying it in the detailed fashion requires wahi, requires the, the revelation of God that was understood and lived through the example of these prophets. But that's not just it. Uh, you can identify it and never live up to it. But having role models that show us it can be lived up to when Allah Azza wa Jal is the center of your life, everything else falls in line. That also is a moral theory, which is what is the foundation upon which morality is built. And so Ibrahim alayhi salam, all of those dimensions, the details of morality, balancing morality, having your morality grounded in a, a God-centric worldview, if we can call it that, right? All yeah. of those are, are identified, right? Uh, yeah. In the story of, of Ibrahim, alayhi salam. So, hey, obviously, this is a very timely discussion. Uh, whenever this season comes, Hajj season, we are reminded of Ibrahim, his sacrifices, his story, you know, people respond to a call that was made by him, uh, you know, that, that, that continues to echo through, throughout all of these. So it is indeed, but you know, there's a connection between ethics. Like, you know, some people might be asking, okay, why are we, for, and for those who have just joined us, uh, we are tonight discussing the Abrahamic ethics or the lessons from the character and the manners of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. SubhanAllah, the high season, you know, when I ask some people, uh, how you know to describe their Hajj experience? They said Hajj refines you and it defines you. It's a test of character, right? When you wow. go to Hajj, and uh, one of the conditions for your Hajj to be sound and accepted is that you have to be at your best manners. So it is indeed a very relevant topic because we're we are again, you know, doing this ritual uh, or or this is the season of Hajj. Ethics are very important. We're, we're told to follow Ibrahim alayhi salam, not only in our practice of the religion, obviously we follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi who was inspired by the millah of Ibrahim, by the tradition of Ibrahim, but we are also supposed to, you know, as you know, we're, we're, we're about to discuss here, see the great beautiful examples and aspects in, in Ibrahim's character uh, and, and his manners. Um, so, you know, subhanAllah, yeah, you're right, uh, you know, absolutely. So it, it, for today's, for a father like me, what, what, you know, what lessons can I learn from Ibrahim alayhi salam or for, or as a community member or as a community servant or, or, you know, we were earlier, you know, having a discussion and subhanAllah, I did not really pay attention to this. I, I love how like nuanced you are in terms of, when you put things together, you said his his relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was an example, but also his relationship with his, you know, with fellow human beings and with his family was also a great example for us. So what do you have to tell us about that? Yeah. Uh, so when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Al-birru husn al right? Righteousness is all about good character. Uh, you would think, wait a minute, but our deen is more than just have being nice with people. Yeah, well, good character isn't just being nice with people. It's a whole bunch of other ways to deal with people. But it's also not just being nice with people. It's about being nice with their creator <laughs> and your creator who you, you owe your existence to, right? 
And so good character needs to start there, needs to start with mastering, if you will, perfecting your understanding or your recognition of the master-slave relationship. And Ibrahim alayhi salam was the perfect example of that. When he had no support system, uh, he knew he had Allah. And when he had no one else uh, subscribing to his religion, he still feared Allah and stayed put. I mean, one of the uh, alternate uh, or additional explanations of Inna Ibrahim akana ummah, Ibrahim was an ummah. The first one, as you mentioned, uh, is that he was an ummah in the sense of he was an example because ummah comes from the same root as the word imam, like a leading example, right? But ummah also means a nation. He was a nation all by himself, meaning his commitment was to Allah first, even if no one else was uh, going to uh, follow along. No one else was going to join in with him. And then you think of Ibrahim alayhi salam also that he was not selective, right? Uh, there's actually a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, a very interesting hadith uh, from Abu Hurair radiallahu an, who said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ibrahim alayhi salam ikhtatana bil qadumi wa huwa ibn 80 sana. That he even circumcised himself uh, with basically the, the sharp side of an axe. Basic tools, yeah. Yeah, basically it doesn't obviously mean swinging an axe. It means the, just the sharp side of the axe, right? Yeah. He uh, used at that, age, at the age of whatever basic tool was available at 80 years old. Like Ibrahim alayhi salam, uh, that's part of mastering the relationship that no matter how much you do for Allah, it's not enough. You can't say I was thrown in the fire and I almost slaughtered my son and now I'm 80. Like <laughs> enough already. This is something incoherent to someone who understands that uh, it's all worth it for the most yeah. beloved, our and creator and for have... the most great. Yeah, and he didn't have the means to, to, to have that done uh, sooner or earlier. As you said, you know, subhanAllah, you're right. You know, it just it just hit me right now that he was he was alone and he he was facing and, and his position was not popular. Right. And, and yet his his connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, helped him get through that. SubhanAllah. Yes. Yeah, so, so that's number one. Uh, number uh, and and sometimes you know they can't the concept of being moral also with people uh nice guys finish last or you know they always get the short end of the stick or you know that idea if you're doing it for reciprocation for appreciation you're probably going to falter in your consistency even with the people but when your morality is grounded in allah azza wa jal, meaning it's defined and like rewarded by allah driven by allah then you will be consistent in your morality uh, you'll always get it right and you'll, you'll always continue doing it because Allah will always appreciate you, subhanahu wa ta'ala. <clears throat> That's a part of it. Uh, another part of it is like uh, when Ibrahim alayhi salam then took his da'wah to the people, this was something uncomfortable for the people. People are telling him, get out of here with the da'wah basically, right? But part of his good character with the people now is that he uh, didn't listen to them. <laughs> Because he knew he had their cure. He knew he had their medicine. And you not giving nasiha to people, uh, you knowing they're on a crash course and you not trying to divert them from their crash course uh, doesn't make you a good person, right? Like not giving them a diagnosis. Yes, you're going to do it gently. And yes, we'll see Ibrahim do that, alayhi salam. But you still have to give it. That's part of good character. You know, they sometimes not, they say, you know, you're, remi you're reminding me of the. They may not like to wear the mask, but if they have to, to wear it, then you have to make them you wear it. You gotta wear the mask. The mask. <laughs> no. You know, uh, the, the concept of like, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day and you uh, teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. Uh, likewise, if, if you uh, are just pleasant, you know, smiling at someone while they're destroying themselves, yeah, you've made them feel good for a moment. But if you give them the, the cold truth in as, you know, like, pleasant appropriate packaging as possible but without diluting the message that could save them you're actually saving them for a lifetime you're saving them for more than a lifetime you're saving them for the unending life for the hereafter and so ibrahim alayhi salam you look at his life uh his people uh means his father even he he threatened him time and time again and he still kept giving him the message but there's another aspect to this, that sometimes we are just so callous and so combative unnecessarily. We think that we have the license to let go of our akhlaq because I'm giving it to him straight, whether he likes it or not. It's for his own good. No, if you really, if it came from the right place, it would come out the right way, you know? Mm -hmm. 
And so Ibn Al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, when he speaks about how he, he went with this uncomfortable truth, this unpopular truth to his father, in Surah Maryam, Allah Azza wa Jal says that Ibrahim alayhi salam said, uh, Ya abati, lima ta'budu ma la yasma'u wa la yubusiru wa la yughni anka shay'a. Oh my dear father, uh, why do you worship like these idols who don't hear anything or see anything or benefit you in any way? So uh, Ibn al-Qayyim says, notice that although he is challenging their worldview uh, and their tribal culture, and it implies, you know, uh, accusing them of falsehood, look at how he packaged it. He said, oh, my dear father. He didn't call him out by his name. You know, number two, he asked him and didn't tell him. He didn't tell him, you're crazy or you're misguided for worshiping that which does not hear or see or benefit. He said, why is it, right? Why is it that you worship something that doesn't do this or doesn't do that or doesn't? And that was part of his gentle approach. Allah Azza wa Jal, you know, loves gentleness. Uh, and he's gentle and loves gentleness and gives on the basis of gentleness what he doesn't give on the basis of anything else, the hadith says. And so if you really want to save someone, you're going to give them that uncomfortable truth. But is in... in a most comfortable or as most comfortable uh, an injection as possible and so we see that and then the ayat continue to tell to say uh, oh my dear father i'm afraid that you may be touched in the slightest by a torment from the most merciful like i'm afraid for you and he is the most merciful do you realize how grave this is that the most merciful would actually punish you you know the whole thing is just, you know, a finesse balance uh, that we really need to learn. It's, you know, these ayat from Surah Maryam are just, you know, so so moving. Subhanallah, the way he speaks to him, you feel, you feel that he, this is someone who really cared about his father. He's being very gentle, you know. And Subhanallah, you know, uh, thank you for bringing this up. You're right. I mean, he said, "Lima ta'budu," right? Why are you worshiping? He's He's challenging him, but at the same time, he's actually giving him a, a very uh, thought-provoking, uh, you know, uh, argument. He's 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 asking him to explain to him. So you can you can go and ex and ask your your someone that you respect to explain to you why they're doing things the way they are doing. Uh, you're not disrespecting them, but at the same time, you're really, uh, you know, uh, putting them, you know. In, in check you're 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 allowing them to think for themselves and that what they're doing doesn't really make you know that much sense subhanallah he was very very and sheikh um you know someone asked me this question uh i don't know i wasn't able to actually subhanallah uh, i wasn't able to to find that information i didn't actually do the research uh, as to how old was ibrahim when when he engaged whether it's his fault, because the Quran said, "Sami'na fatayyat Quran," right? So, do do you have any? No, I don't believe there are. Uh, I did a tiny bit of uh, research. I had to do a paper. It was one of the only research studies I got to do while in Medina before I had to come back. Uh, mine was about. Uh, I just gave it a fancy title. It was just called the Futuhat al-Rabbaniyah fi al Khaliliyah about Ibrahim alayhi salam, right? Just whatever Allah opened my eyes to of the, the perfect character traits of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Uh, and I, I didn't find, I tried to, I guess, scan the Nafasir for, you know, uh, what I could about the ayat of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And I don't think we have anything in the Quran or the Sunnah and Allah Azza knows best, not as if I have a conclusive, you know, scope of this stuff uh, regarding this. And... Uh, we do know that he was young, as you as you mentioned. The ayah says he was young, but what is a feta? I mean, maybe under forty would still be a feta, right? <laughs> uh, some some say that a gulam could even be uh, loosely someone under forty. And so, uh, what we should say, though, to the likes of these questions in general, is that the most important facts of his story are in the Quran or in the Sunnah. Allah Azza wa Jal is not forgetful. If it was, you know, an essential part of the story that we needed. Uh, Allah would have said it to us, would have informed us in his book or on the tongue of his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa Yeah, but you can still be young and be gentle and be kind and be respectful, right? Yes, tabarakallah, that's, that's, uh, 
Yeah. Very thoughtful connection. Yes. Yeah. So like when people become religious, <laughs> they, they have this selective read. I'll give you a personal embarrassing story in a minute to make your show entertaining. <laughs> it's actually related to Ibrahim alayhi salam, but you just reminded me of it. Uh, but yeah, like why is it the day you become religious is the day that all your problems start with your parents and with your siblings and with your the average masjid goer? Yes, we understand that, uh, that you're a fiery guy or you're a fiery gal and you're passionate about your deen. But you need to realize that this is something you need to grow out of fast. Because when the Prophet ﷺ says righteousness is good character, that means you need to consider what people think of your character. That is very telling of your, your righteousness in the eyes of Allah Azza wa Jal. Um, when, when the Prophet ﷺ says righteousness is good character, Ibn al-Qayyim said that means whoever outdoes you in character has outdone you in deen. Because this character is the deen. That's what it's all about. Uh, and when you have a problem with people and it gets personal and it gets tense and it's, this is like the, the norm for you, uh, then you, your problem is not really with the people. It's with your disregard of them belonging to Allah. Your problem is with Allah because they are his servants, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And so, al, al, you know, the narration of al-khalq Allah, the creation are the ayal, some people mistranslate it as children of God. No, ayal means the dependents of God. These are the people that Allah cares for around the clock. And so for you to be, uh, you know, injurious to them, for you to be uh, arrogant and pompous with them means your problem is with him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. You need to be very worried about that sort of bulm and what it places you at odds with. Um, but as for my embarrassing story, I am speaking so heavily about this or, or pushing about it maybe to make up for my past. And I think I have a semi-defense for why I was a little bit like that for a short while, aside from the fact that I was young and that it's a defense mechanism sometimes that like you hate so much where you were that <laughs> you try to like project that hate uh, and that roughness with whoever still like that out of fear that you fall back into it. Not a justification, but you just need to understand where that comes from. Uh, in any case, Ibrahim alayhi salam is said uh, to have said to his people in, in, in Surah Al-Muntahana, قَدْ كَانَتْ لَكُمْ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ فِي إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَالَّذِينَ uh, You have a perfect example in Ibrahim and those that were with him. Uh, we are totally clear of you and everything you worship besides Allah. Uh, we have denied you. Uh, and there has arisen between us and you uh, enmity and hatred forever until you worship Allah alone. So whoever reads this and has the insecurity that a person sometimes has when they first become religious and they're looking to like insulate themselves from like anti-religious influences, you'll say, okay, that's the way I'm supposed to treat everybody else. Ibrahim is my example. I got nothing to do with you guys. I hate you for the sake, you're my enemy for the sake of Allah. Uh, because this is a, a presupposition that it's supposed to be this way. It's supposed to match my fiery young age. And so you think that ayah is the norm. When that ayah might be the norm, just for not the same people. These are this ayah was in Surah Al-Mutahana. This ayah came down about the Meccans who just breached the treaty and essentially waged war. These are with regards to militant, hostile people. And so Ibrahim alayhi salam's example with people that threw him into a fire and time and time again were rebellious to someone they saw clearly was the Prophet of God. Maybe someone in that case scenario they need to see a different face from you. At that point, there are, there's no more room for uh, warmth without you totally walking away from your past, without you believing in Allah. But the fact that they disagree with you or even disbelieve in your God would not warrant that. And actually, interestingly, the proof is in Surah Al-Mutahana. Surah Al-Mutahana itself, a few ayat later, is the, is the surah that says, just on the next page, Allah does not prevent you from those who don't fight you regarding your religion, being kind to them, being just to them. Allah loves those that are just, uh, those who are not fighting you for the sake of your religion, expelling you from your homes because you're a believer. Allah does not forbid you from being nice with them, kind with them, just with them. You seek nearness to God through being just with them. The next verse says, Allah only forbids you from uh, being kind with those 
who are fighting you because you're a Muslim, waging war on you because you're a Muslim, expelling you from your homes, driving you out of your, uh, your lands because you're a Muslim. So what I'm just trying to say is we can always find evidence in the Quran and Sunnah to justify our bad akhlaq or our bad behavior. But if you come to it as a clean slate, you come to it truly seeking guidance, you will see that this is an exception to the rule uh, that applies, it is actually part of good manners, part of good manners uh, to, to have a very different face, right? To, be, to show your, your dignity, to show your fearlessness, to show your trust in Allah when there's something of that nature. But otherwise, Ibrahim alayhi salam was very different as the norm. Could, could we say that this is something that also was revealed to him and it's a measure that he had to take at a later stage you know, like for instance, in the other ayah, well, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, That this was not from the get-go, you know, that, that he, but at a later stage, once Ibrahim exhausted all means to persuade his people or to bring them to, to guidance, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at some point, prophets and messengers are instructed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to part ways from their people and walk away. Right, like you know what happened with Prophet, his his nephew Prophet Lut alayhi salam, and 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 many other prophets. So could we say that this was at a later stage? Allah subhanahu wa taala gave him, uh, you know, Allah subhanahu wa taala, you know, inspired him or revealed to him, just like what happened with Nuh alayhi salam. I mean, 950 years, and then eventually it was revealed to him, and no, la yu'min min qawmika illa man qad aman. This is it. It's over, right? So it is at that stage that you have to basically part ways and you go your own separate way. Uh, can, can we say that? Uh, so long as we, we're saying that in the sense that this is not limited, I mean, I would agree uh, with the caveat that it's not limited to you receiving direct revelation, which means it would be impossible, right? After the seal of prophethood. Uh, the, uh, uh, no, we are saying that you don't, uh, our deen is a balance between mercy and strength like mercy all the time even after the age of the prophets right mercy and like smiles and pleasantries all the time would actually be a sign of weakness you would get overrun it, this, would, this would embolden those who have no conscience for those who don't understand a goodwill because our deen deals with reality that's actually part of the, the Abrahamic character the Abrahamic morality that you know some people interestingly you know one of like the the most intelligent minds of our time, Noam Chomsky. I was told by people who, who approached him, Muslims who approached him personally, uh, seeing many of his views are very sympathetic to Islamic values. He said I, he refused to look into Islam because I don't accept any religion whatsoever uh, that condones the use of force, right? And that, that's, that may come from the right place, right? It's a beautiful sentiment to be totally pacifist. But pacifists don't exist in the real world because they are overrun, right? Like, it is not the akhlaq of certain countries that keeps other countries from overrunning them. It's the presence of their armies, for example, right? So strength respects strength. That's the idea. Islam does not promote violence. Unfortunately, criminality and crimes against humanity and wars are just the inv inevitable reality of the human experience. And so when they physically took Ibrahim alayhi salam and, you know, waged war on him and were persecuting physically, this requires equal strength to keep them at bay, right? And so in any similar situation, uh, Allah Azza wa says that to us even in the Quran. He says, وَمَا لَكُمْ This, of course, now is not promoting violence. This was addressing the Prophet Sallam as the head of a state. All of these things should always be understood, right? But there is the point where Allah Azza wa says, why don't you fight in the path of Allah? And those who are being oppressed of the women and the children who are praying to God to remove us from these oppressive lands to the end of it, right? And so some things are worth but, fighting for. Yeah, That's part of but the, the case, Valor is, in, is part of the package. Yeah. In the case of Ibrahim, that wasn't even an option. Ibrahim alayhi salam just was told to walk away and he just walked away and he started his community and started his, uh, you know, ummah somewhere Which else. Which is he even had to greater relocate. valor, right? Yeah. And for sure, yeah, in, in our context, for sure, none of yeah. this actually applies in, in the sense that would only apply to uh, a legitimate authority or a legitimate government or otherwise. Uh, but in principle, says, strength yeah. in the face of violence.
violence, protecting the weak and the, and the weaker sectors of society. You know, even today, <laughs> the, the concept of defunding the police, by the way, that people are speaking about for the sake of morality, uh, th that may seem to be a good idea at first glance. But do, do you know what would happen if there isn't a, a government sanctioned force that has a clear uh, leverage in terms of artillery, has, a, has cuffs and, and cars and radios and guns? Do you know what this country will look like, you know, without there being strength to protect the rights of, you know, the individuals in society? So what if someone says, but wait, Ibrahim السلام, early on, he took on the idols. He actually took an axe and he went and destroyed all the idols in protest or, you know, if, if I may use that term, in protest of what his people were doing. And yeah. he spared, he spared, obviously, the, you know, the, the main, you know, the, the largest one. Yeah. Just to give them, you know, to, to, you know, as, as a way of him trying to basically make a point. In so that one, I would to... agree. I would agree 110% that that one would have to be wahi. Uh, and even if it were wahi, uh, for sure it's wahi for Ibrahim alayhi salam. It would have to be by way of revelation um, because our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was told different. Uh, was told don't even speak bad, uh, meaning don't exactly. curse at, right? Do not curse at those they're worshipping instead of Allah. Do not worshipping instead of Allah. Lest uh, they reciprocate by cursing Allah uh, without knowledge, and so uh, when he was the the weak, uh, weaker sector of society, he had to weigh the pros and cons, and it was a greater con in you um, provoking them in this way. But of course, later on, when when Quraysh, when Quraysh or the disbelievers from Quraysh uh, basically betrayed and and sparked the feuds between between the tribes and the Prophet Sallallahu had every right now to protect himself preemptively by going into Mecca and clearing out those war criminals. And it happened peacefully. At that point, he removed the idols at a much, much later stage. So what Ibrahim salam did there, while he had zero supporters, or at most he had his wife and Lut salam, if they were with him at that point, right? Then that's definitely not the majority, it's definitely not leverage. So it must have been wahi, must have been revelation. And Allah knows best. Can we move on at a, you know, to the later stage of Ibrahim's life before yes. we, we run out of time? Because, you know, moving forward, subhanAllah, it's amazing that, you know, I, one thing that I find fascinating is Ibrahim alayhi salam and his, um, and his approach, uh, you know, towards his father. But later on, when you study also his relationship, whether it's with his wives or his children, it's just, you know, Subhanallah, th there was so much compassion. So he was a great son, but he he was also you know, the greatest father, subhanAllah. Yes. Yeah, subhanAllah, Ali. There's so much to, to learn about that. I mean, uh, first and foremost, akhlaq, having uh, you know, good character, comes from a certain environment. Ibrahim السلام, didn't have that environment. He had a gift from Allah but he understood that he had the responsibility to provide that environment for others, right? He's an exception. It usually doesn't happen like this. Uh, and so, you know, for when you find, uh, for example, the story of building the Kaaba, uh, he had his son with him in stride as they're building the Kaaba. And he wanted his son to be a part of this legacy. Uh, and not only did he involve him in the con physical construction of the Kaaba, he made dua alongside his son to Allah to accept this humble effort from them. And so involvement, you know, in the deen or working for Allah's deen and at the same time showing Allah humility that you can never uh, serve in a manner befitting of his greatness. All of that was something he modeled right in front of his son. That's a part of it. That's all akhlaq with Allah, right? And then also Ibrahim alayhi salam did something that we all need to do a better job at which is keep close tab on your family, right? One of the greatest, you know, uh, regrets that so many parents have is not seeing certain crises, certain train wrecks that happen in the developmental, you know, uh, in the development of their kids until it actually happened. We know when Ibrahim alayhi salam comes to his son and he says to him, uh, 
I see in my sleep that I am uh, slaughtering you. Like there's so much to learn from that story. And those are lectures on their own, of course. But yeah. why was he asking him this? Was he asking him, you know, should I obey Allah or not? Because he's going to listen to him? No, for sure not. <laughs> he's asking him, how do you feel about that? Right? Uh, to make sure that it wasn't just Ibrahim alayhi salam submitting and his son resisting, but that they both were submitting. And that's why the ayah says, فَلَمَّا أَسْلَمَا Right? When the two of them submitted to the will of Allah Azza wa Jal. Uh, you know, uh, may Allah give him shifa, Sheikh Abu Saqal Hawaini. Uh, he says, you know, like, ask your, your involve your children with, with the, just to, to probe their brains. You need to, this is your responsibility, right? To make sure they have someone with you to direct them aright. Ask them, if you had a million dollars, what would you do? If he tells you, I'll buy cotton candy with it, you'll know there's a problem. <laughs> you know, if you were, if you led this ummah, what would you do? And so you, you help refine them uh, in their outlook in general by being available as a mentor. It's part of good akhlaq with your family. You know, subhanAllah, obviously prophets and messengers are, you know, amazing as communicators. They have, they have great abilities. Uh, but you're, you know, I find Ibrahim alayhi salam to be just amazing in his, uh, whether, if, whether, whether it is his relationship with his wives and how he communicates with them. And you get the sense that he had a very like open, honest relationship with, with both of his wives, especially Sarah uh, alayhi salam, uh, and his children as well. He was very, you know, he would like communicate, engage them. Uh, but, but there's this moment that the Qur'an basically mentions in, in more than one place. Uh, obviously, scholars talk about his generosity. But, you know, there's something that I find fascinating. I don't know. I would like to hear your thoughts about it. Is when the angels came to him, right? These are now strangers. Because, obviously, he, he doesn't... At, the, at that point, when they came, they came in, a, in human form. So... And he didn't realize they were angels uh, until he actually went and, like, he didn't even say, okay, identify yourselves. What, what are you here for? What is your mission? He did, you know, he took the time, like, he rushed to go get them, them food, right? Mm -hmm. Post them. And, you know, he was very hospitable, alayhi salam. So, um, and, and it just hit me that, you know, in order for you to, like, prepare a meal like that for your guests, these guests have to really be special people, people that you know, like, you know, like yourself, if you come, <laughs> you know what I mean? It has to be someone that you really, really know, someone who has, like, who means a lot to you. But it seems that he was just like that, and he would offer that to anyone, right, who would come yeah. to him and welcome them. I mean, what is, what is your thought of that? Oh, now? no. So this is the worst question ever <laughs> to ask me. <laughs> Because I gave a khutbah on this passage and I realized that it was overkill for a khutbah. So it was too much because like, you know, Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, about this passage in Surah Al-Safat, about the guests of Ibrahim, alayhi salam, he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like I consider this one of the proofs of the Quran being Allah's words. <laughs> he combined all of the akhlaq, the adab, the protocols on guest hosting in this tiny three, four lines. Uh, and so for Allah Azza wa Jal says, Hal hadithu? I'll just walk through it quickly. Hal hadithu Ibrahim al Has there come to you the news of the, the guests whom uh, uh, Ibrahim honored? If dakhalu alayhi, when they entered upon him, so they didn't even knock. Apparently, Ibrahim alayhi salam would leave his door wide open for guests. They just walked in. That was, you know, uh, and, and some scholars say that Ibrahim was the first person alayhi salam to host guests. It was abnormal. It was a social abnormality. And so not only was he the first to invite people to his house, like in human history, he literally would keep the door open. It was an open-ended invite. They walk in on him and they said, Salaman. Salaman means a peace, right? A, like a greeting of peace. He didn't say Salaman. He said Salamun. Right? And so he said, may peace continue to be upon you. So he responded with a better response and then they said, may a peace be upon you. Uh, and he said, may peace always be with you. That's the implication in that tiny wording. 
And that is what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to respond with that which is better or at the very least equal. He did that which is better. Uh, so he's being welcoming. He's being more welcoming. More coming, uh, yeah. Than they are when they, you know, greeted him. He was even you know, more because, welcoming in his greeting. Yeah, the guests may come to your place. They may feel a little awkward or, you know, apprehensive or something. They can't be comfortable. Then you, you tell them, make yourself home, be, you know, relax. So depending on your response, your response is what is going to make them feel either comfortable or, or remain to be like uptight and feel awkward. So that's great. That's a beautiful. Okay, keep going. Uh, so, he said, unknown people, continuous peace be upon you, unknown. He didn't say, I don't know you. He's saying you're unknown, as if to indirectly say this town doesn't know you, but I'm not necessarily saying like you're suspicious. He didn't say, unkirukum, qala munkarun. You know, he said it in the passive tense. Uh, and then he says, faragha ila ahlihi. Rawagan huwa al khafa, right? Zahab bi khafa. So he slid, he snuck Discreetly, off, literally. Okay. Yeah. He snuck off to his family. Why? Because if you're going to say, hold on one second, I'm going to go get you some food. You're kind of saying like, are you sure you want to eat? <laughs> <laughs> like, hopefully they'll say, no, we just had a meal. So part of it's his character, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so Ibrahim السلام, snuck off to not make them feel that they're burdening him. So he snuck off, Allah says, and then he comes back with Ijlin Samin. Ijl means a baby cow, like a calf. Uh, 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 Samin means meaty. So he got a nice, uh, like luscious, fat, meaty calf. And we're talking yeah, about three people. Three people in Ibrahim is four. That's, we would think it's overkill. And that's why Ibn al-Qayyim says this is actually proof that it's not wasting to bring your guests, honor them with more food than they can eat. Of course, he means on the condition that you don't throw their leftovers. You give it out or like mm -hmm. store it or whatever it is, right? Uh, and then he brought it close to them. He didn't tell them, get up to the dinette, right? <laughs> yeah, he made it even easier. He brought to them the food where they are. So he didn't send his wife or his servant. He did it himself to further honor them. And then he brought it to them. He didn't bring them to it to further you know, be gracious to them. And then he said to them, will you not eat? Which is more courteous than saying eat. Will you not eat is gentler, is softer. Uh, and then he felt some sort of apprehension towards them. Of course, they're angels, they're not going to eat. And so he didn't show them that he was uncomfortable with their behavior. Awjasa means he felt it, meaning he, he refused to show it, which was part of his good akhlaq. Sometimes your guests do stuff that's weird, right? <laughs> We're not all raised the same way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It may not even be right or wrong. It's just like cultural misunderstandings. So he you should try to reaction. overlook it. Yeah, conceal yeah. your reactions. Yeah. Uh, as they're breaking your, as their kids are breaking your furniture. <laughs> no, yeah. hopefully not. So the funny thing is like the week before or the week after, I don't remember, I gave a khutbah on how to be a well-behaved guest, according to the deen, just to like compensate being a good host. Yeah. The hosts don't get run over. Be like the angels. Yeah, hopefully. Don't eat and, the food. <laughs> they said, don't fear. And they gave him, they finally admitted that we're here actually to bring you good news of a knowledgeable son to the end of the story. And so, yeah, Qayyim says all of the perfect akhlaq of a guest host to be a master guest host, according to like the, the moral character rubric of the deen is found in these three lines of Ibrahim alayhi salam story. Alayhi salatu wassalam. It's beautiful. You know, um, yeah, there's a lot to be said about that, subhanAllah. Salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. You know, um, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, we have five minutes left. You know, Ibrahim alayhi salam met the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Right, and he sent this ummah a beautiful gift. You know, no, uh, you know, which uh, which is, uh, you know, a reminder that he, alayhi salatu salam, cared for us, and this is the season for us to really take advantage of the gift of Ibrahim. So, what a beautiful uh, ending! Any any word of advice as to how you know, in terms of like taking advantage, 
of these 10 precious days. I mean, it's not 10 anymore. I mean, we have less now. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the overarching character trait of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, our Prophet Muhammad, was Rahmah, right? Mercy and concern and compassion for this Ummah. And SubhanAllah, Ibrahim Alayhi Salam was making dua for us before we came that Allah send us a prophet and show us the way and all of He had great concern for us. And so the hadith you're referring to, uh, you know, uh, speaks to that point very much. The hadith is in Surah Tirmidhi uh, or Ibn Mas'ud. I remember the first time I, uh, I heard this hadith was from Baqi Yasir Khaldi, and so it sticks in my brain. Uh, ya yeah, Muhammad, aqri ummataka minni salam. Yeah, he said to yeah. Dr. Yeah. Yasir actually said, jannata. Yeah, that uh, I have a gift for you from Ibrahim alayhi salam. It was brought to us by Abu Isa Tirmidhi. The way he framed it was just very suspenseful. So Tirmidhi has it from Mas'ud that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi told us that right. Ibrahim alayhi salam said to him, Aqri, O Muhammad, uh, recite or convey to your ummah from me salam uh, and inform them that uh, Jannah is lush and green uh, and that its valleys uh, its valleys are, are basically ready to be planted uh, or they're, they're bare for you to, to work in them, right? You, you, you work in them in this dunya, meaning and you, you harvest there. He said, and the way to plant in these, uh, these valleys is by saying subhanallah and alhamdulillah and la ilaha illallah and allahu akbar. Allah and Allah you just Allah connected it with our 10 days, right? The days when we remember Allah Ibrahim alayhi salam. And we make this dhikr. And we make uh, our houses vibrate with these words and echo these words like Medina used to and Ibn Umar used to walk in the market saying these words to the people. Allahu akbar, Allahu akbar, Allahu akbar. Or whatever wordings you know, they would say them and remind each other of them. And so it's important to revive that at least within the uh, the sanctuaries that are are our homes. Subhanallah, what a beautiful gift, Subhanallah. He is he continued his khair and his his baraka alayhi salatu salam, salam continued salam. even after, and he sent us a special message through the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, who delivered it to the Sahaba, and the Sahaba passed on this message or this beautiful gift until Imam Tirmidhi rahimahullah, <laughs> you know, uh, made sure that he 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 includes that hadith in his and his collection. And subhanAllah, here we are. So brothers and sisters, a gift from none other than our father, the greatest, uh, one of the greatest um, characters uh, in, in the history of humanity, Ibrahim alayhi salam, to all of you out there, you know, that plant your trees in Jannah, you know, adorn and decorate your palace in Jannah and your, your properties in Jannah with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, Wa la ilaha illallah, wa allahu akbar. Trees will be planted for you, inshallah ta'ala, in Jannah. This is a season where we should take advantage. And remember Allah Azza wa Jalla, as Allah says, Udhkurullah fi ayyam al ma'lumah. Shaykh Muhammad, uh, you know, last night we asked Shaykh Farid to do this, and we would love for you, inshallah Azza wa Jal, to, inshallah, also conclude with a dua for our community members, especially those uh, who may be uh, suffering from uh, an illness of any kind, especially, you know, uh, those who were tested positive or those who have loved ones or family members who may have been affected by this pandemic or maybe, um, you know, undergoing, you know, a, a procedure or may have some health condition that they are suffering from, uh, as well as, you know, the rest of the community members that Allah keeps us safe and blesses us, inshallah ta'ala. So, uh, absolutely. Allah, Allah بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم اشفهم شفاء لا يغادر سقما اللهم اشفهم شفاء لا يغادر سقما اللهم اشفهم شفاء لا يغادر سقما اللهم ماذا في البأس عنهم رب الناس الشين الشاف لا شفاء لا شفاء شفاء لا يغادر سقما نسأل الله العظيم رب العرش العظيم أن يشفيه We ask Allah عز وجل to wipe over them with His healing right hand to write for them both the recovery and the reward We ask Allah to remove all harm to cure for He is the one that cures a cure that leaves behind no traces of the ailment. We ask Allah, Amen. the most great, the owner of the great throne, Amen. to give them all a cure, to give them all a cure, to give them all a perfect cure. We ask Allah to replace them for their health with better health and their wealth with better wealth. And we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to send patience and soothe upon their families. May Allah Azza wa Jal forgive those that have been tried. May Allah Azza wa Jal comfort those that are, that are anxious. And may Allah Azza wa Jal accept as martyrs those that have passed. 
And we ask Allah for every single one of us to grant us the fear of him that would be a barrier between us and disobeying. And we ask him to grant us acts of obedience that would deliver us to his paradise and grant the certainty that would make light for us the burdens of the calamities of this world and to allow us to enjoy our hearing and our sight and our strength until the day that we meet him and to only allow our vengeance to be against those who have wronged us and to give us support against those who oppress us. We ask Allah to not make this dunya the extent of our concerns or the brink of our knowledge and to not empower against us those that would not have mercy with us. May Allah send his finest, most abundant, most continuous blessings upon our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and our father Ibrahim alayhi salam and all those who tread their path or attempt to do so until the last day. Allahumma ameen. Jazakallah khairan, Shaykh. Jazakallah khairan from all of us here in the Memphis Islamic Center community as well as anyone out there who is part of our uh, you know, viewers and, and, and audience. Jazakallah khairan, Shaykh Muhammad yeah, Shinali for taking the time to join us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you and your family a joyous and blessed, uh, you know, uh, Eid for you and your family. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to uh, meet again, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakallah khair for accepting our um, invitation. It's always a pleasure to be in your company, Shaykh. Barakallah fiqh. 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 Barakallah fiqh.